We'll go ahead and turn it over to Virginia, the president of the Island Wildlife Chapter, to introduce today's guest speaker. Thank you, Madison. I'm, I'm delighted to welcome you and CW Professor Roger Shu to the Island Wildlife Speaker Series. Roger's geologic background is in sedimentology, stratigraphy, sedimentary petrology, subsurface methods, core log and geophysical interpretation, resource geology, and science education. He's involved in studies of coastal issues and processes and surface and groundwater sources and quality in southeastern North Carolina. He's provided input on discussions of offshore energy resources, having worked in the energy industry, coastal hazards, and water resources. An additional area of current interest is geoscience and environmental education. He works with numerous groups on a wide range of projects, including the design and construction of BMPs for stormwater runoff and on studies of threatened ecosystems, endangered species, restoration projects and mitigation, Superfund sites and water quality. He's on the Sustainability Committee of UNCW, on the board of Cape Fear River Watch, and serves as a member of the Eagles Island Task Force. His goal is to combine teaching, research, and outreach for the benefit of the community. I'd also like to say he's a wonderful person whose extensive knowledge of the Cape Fear region is unsurpassed. Roger, thank you for joining us today. Uh, today, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the Green Swamp and surrounding areas, and thank you very much for having me to uh, on board to make this presentation. Um, this is a picture of one of the places down in the Green Swamp. Uh, this is called Spring, Spring Bean Savanna. It's about one and a half acres in size, and this is a classic look for one of our savannas that's down there. We call them wet pine savannas. So we're going to be looking today at uh, some of the setting, the significance and management of these areas. We've got a couple of pictures there. You can see the grasses and the longleaf pines as the canopy. But we also have quite a few uh, important plants. All of you are very well familiar with our iconic species, the Venus flytrap. Uh, the yellow flower is uh, less well known, but it's an endangered species there called Lysimachia asperlifolia. And we have lots and lots of different wildflowers, and I'll show you a few of those down in the green swamp as well. One of the really important things about this area as a really historic landmark site uh, and heritage site is that it really does have a lot of biodiversity uh, in it. And it's one of uh, my wife and I's favorite places. In fact, Dale was listed here. We do work with the Nature Conservancy. It's one of our favorite places to go to. And I think if you went down there, it would be one of yours as well. So I'd like to also thank in particular the Nature Conservancy. Uh, the management that they do and the purchase and acquisition and management of lands is really critical. Uh, we think it's one of the best organizations going. And we'd like to thank the Southeastern Office in particular of the Nature Conservancy that has provided us the opportunity to work with them for the last almost 20 years and doing work in the Green Swamp and other places. Uh, it's really been uh, you know, a good relationship. And I think we've all done some things that may be beneficial in looking at some of the management strategies uh, that you'll see. We don't have a lot of time today to cover a lot of things on this. Uh, if I've gotten older, I'm talking longer. Uh, and so maybe I have to come back sometime and talk about the rest of it. But anyway, I wanted to talk to you about this uh, area. And again, thanks for the opportunity. Well, I call this uh, longleaf pine uh, area, as well as the carnivorous plants, two of the seven natural wonders of the Southeast Coastal Plain. You might notice there it's called Shoe Seven Natural Wonders. Uh, we're actually doing a project to uh, summarize these important areas such as the Cape Fear River and bottomland hardwoods, our barrier islands and salt marshes, Blackwater rivers, Carolina bays. So all of these areas are really important uh, in southeastern North Carolina. And it's a reason why a lot of people come here 
And I'm hopeful that, you know, you guys seeing this today, as well as other presentations at Island Wildlife and North Carolina Wildlife Federation and others have put together over the years, you know, really uh, spurs you to make sure and be advocates uh, for protection of these areas. Uh, the old song that used to be there, I won't sing it, you would be appalled, but uh, Wonderland of Variety, Coast of Mountains, it's great to be right here in North Carolina. And it's great to be right here in North Carolina because we have a lot of these kinds of things that you see uh, in the background here. And of course, one of the uh, really big things that happened uh, back in 2016, as it says there, the coastal plain, the Atlantic and Gulf coastal, plain, coastal were identified as global biodiversity hotspots. And Eastern North Carolina is certainly one of those areas. Said that it had a remarkably high number of unique species that are found nowhere else on earth. And I just highlight that in the uh, Boiling Spring Lakes, that's what BSL is, and the Green Swamp, there's a large number of vascular plants, which is just those that have a supporting uh, structure to allow food and moisture to move through uh, the system, is that we have a very large number of species and some endemics to only uh, those areas. So as you can see here, it was designated the 36 Global Biodiversity Hotspot. And one of the pictures that highlighted that is this one. This is actually one of the savannas. This is a uh, shoestring savanna that I'll show you a couple of pictures of uh, in a little bit. And of course, this picture, which is one that many people have used, I still like to use it as well. Uh, this is the Nature Conservancy map showing you some of the biodiversity hotspots around the United States. And you notice that little dimple right there in southeastern North Carolina. And one of the reasons that we have such good biodiversity here is because of the different ecosystems that we do have. We have over 16 natural communities just in southeastern North Carolina. And these are just some of them like the Zurich Sandhill community, like on UNCW campus, as well as at Boiling Spring Lakes, uh, the Longleaf Pine Wet Savannas and Pocosins. This is from the Green Swamp. Of course, our Blackwater uh, areas, like, such as the Black River, the South, the Northeast Cape Fear River, really important areas. And of course, you all know about the 2,600 year old plus tree uh, that's on the Black River, fantastic place to go. We also have tidal creeks and marshes, and of course our barrier islands and marshes too. So we have a lot of healthy ecosystems, uh, well worth protecting and making sure that they are managed properly in southeastern North Carolina. And one of the highlights of that really is the longleaf pine uh, historical areas along that coastal plain zone. What you can see here is the range of longleaf uh, from the past from Virginia all the way over to uh, East Texas. You can see here that most of it is east of the Mississippi Valley. We call that the Eastern Coastal Plain. West of that is the Western Coastal Plain. Most all of the longleaf pines are in uh, this part uh, of the area. You might notice that there is some in the Piedmont, but most of it is in the Coastal Plain. One of the things that's been happening over the years, of course, is that longleaf pines um, were being cut down, used for naval stores, uh, multiple other things that were happening to the forest. So a reduction from the original 90 million acres, I'm sure most of you have heard about, to around three to three and a half million acres. And in 2009, uh, realizing this and the fact that it is an endangered ecosystem, it was a goal set forth to try and restore longleaf to over or about 8 million acres by 2025. I'm pleased to say that uh, because of Nature Conservancy, Longleaf Alliance and many others is longleaf are being restored. It's over 4 million acres now uh, with a, a ways to go, but uh, we're getting there. I wanted to show I'm a geologist, but you know, I like to combine biology history, culture, and geology. And to me, that's really the name of the game is integrating data. And I wanted to have a little diversion here because as you see this map, what you see is a distribution along the coastal plain 
of the longleaf. And just to highlight in that, this whole area has significant uh, and important soil types that lead to the presence of not just longleaf, but other agricultural products as well. And since we just went through an election season, I thought I would show you uh, something that ties in with that. So here's the green swamp, as you can see in southeastern North Carolina. We have four main types of areas, the montane, the mountainous, sand hill, rolling hill, flatwoods, and savannas uh, for our longleaf pines. And again, as I mentioned, most of those, as you can see here, are east of the Mississippi Valley. You can see the sand hills up in here, and we certainly have some fantastic sand hill communities in North Carolina. If you ever have a chance, make sure and go to Weymouth Woods uh, up just west of Fort Bragg. It's an absolutely fantastic place to see uh, longleaf, red cockaded woodpecker, and many other things. And one of the oldest uh, trees is for longleaf is in that area. So I wanted to show you this though to illustrate, you know, the importance of the coastal plain. So back in Cretaceous time, I told you I'm a geologist, so 75 million years ago, give or take, um, most of the coastal plain was underwater. And you can see that in this relationship. And if you look at a map, I just picked Alabama here. What you can see is in this area, as I'm pointing to, those areas are uh, parts of the Appalachians. These bands, as you see them here, are Cretaceous and Tertiary or Cenozoic younger types of rocks. And right in here, we had lots of limestones, uh, even some chalk deposits that have led to the formation of really black soils. And these black soils became really important for cotton production. As you can see here, the cotton production as goes with that, it follows right along that band as well as in the Mississippi Valley, but in the black soils, as you can see here. You can also see uh, the other historical aspect uh, of this. If you look in this map down in the lower left, you can see uh, slave numbers uh, back in 1840. And what you see is the distribution of slaves in three places, in the Mississippi Valley, along the black soils, as well as in the coastal plain here, or the coastal zone of South uh, Carolina and Georgia. This is, of course, part of the rice uh, culture, as well as naval stores. This particular area is because of cotton uh, plantations. And it turns out that over the years, you know, the people stayed in this area even after being freed. And that continues in looking at uh, the distribution of election results uh, even today. What you can see in the Mississippi Valley area, as well as in that same black soil belt where the cotton was grown, you can still see the election results. Blue is Democratic, red is Republican. And this is the African-American population that is primarily uh, still residing in part of that area. And this has been continuing. This is really the intersection of looking at um, you know, geology, history, uh, really a historical uh, results of what happened over the last two to three centuries. And it's present or true in every election that's been held since the 1980s for sure. As you can see in this, you can see the same black soil belt all the way and it continued into 2020. Now I tell you this for another reason as well. One of the things that happened to longleaf pines is that longleaf pines were cleared because of agriculture. So the loss of forested areas were cleared for these really rich agricultural lands too. And that's the story I want to tell you a little bit about uh, for our longleaf pine heritage. If you looked at the longleaf pine as an endangered ecosystem, William Bartram, way back in 1789, y'all know about Bartram's travels, find ourselves on the entrance of a vast plain which extends uh, 60 or 70 miles. Uh, you know, and they always said that you, know, you could have a squirrel uh, that wouldn't have to hit the ground. He could just go in the trees forever in a day. And by 1932, uh, ecologist, botanist at NC State, 
said that, well, not one part of this great natural wonder worthy of the name forest remains intact. And it said it was rooted out by hogs, mutilated by turpentine, and cut down for lumbering or burned through negligence. And it's one of the great crimes of American history, uh, as he said. And a few things go along with that. So what I'd like to show you is the causes of the loss of the longleaf pine forest. By the way, this is one of my all-time favorite Postal Service stamps. This was a longleaf pine wet savanna uh, stamp. That was many years ago, uh, but it's still one of my favorites. So what is the cause of the loss of biodiversity? Well, these are the things that the IUCN has looked at, the International Union for Conservation of Nature Group. It's called the Red List. And what they've said is that overexploitation, agricultural activity, urban development, et cetera, are the big losses of biodiversity. And believe it or not, those are the big three for uh, the historical loss of longleaf pines. So I want to show you a couple of these things, as you can see. By the way, as you see here, climate change is over here, but it's up and coming. But really, most of the loss has been in this area. So the first one is looking at overexploitation. And of course, longleaf pines are really fantastic trees for uh, lumber building. It was used for everything, telephone poles, et cetera, et cetera. Also, of course, had naval stores, uh, the use of the naval stores for caulking vessels, for protecting ropes and other materials uh, and seagoing vessels. And of course, where did that come from? It came from two things, notching the longleaf pine trees, very labor intensive work and also in tar kilns or charcoals as they're called. And here you can see another piece of it, and this is going to make turpentine. So you're distilling some of the product to make turpentine, which was then used for many goods, including medicines, as well as paints and thinners and coatings. And of course, Wilmington played a big role in naval stores. It was the naval stores export capital of the world for many, many years. And in fact, the Wilmington Naval Stores was even listed with the New York Times uh, in the 1870s as shown here. It gave prices just like on the stock market for the goods uh, such as spirits of turpentine, yellow dip, virgin turpentine, et cetera, et cetera. And here you can see two of the things that were I mentioned. This is a tarkle or tar kiln. What they would do is they'd pile the lumber up like shown here. Uh, up at Tumbrel uh, near Jones Lake. It's a really good display area if you ever want to go up there and see uh, displays for the naval stores industry. And then what they would do is take soil from around that and throw it up on top. They'd light it on fire underneath and the resin would ooze out of the stumps and pieces of wood into a barrel that'd be at this location. This is what it would look like in this pictorial. It was burned underground so it wouldn't burn so fast and so it would just lead to the oozing out of the wood or the uh, tar and pitch as opposed to burning it up. And that's what the material looks like as you can see these little drips coming off the longleaf pine. And the longleaf is certainly the best of the best trees for this uh, resin, although slash pines have some as well. So very labor intensive following the Civil War, it really uh, greatly reduced, but it still continued even into the 1900s. And in Wilmington, just to show you, this is a view of Wilmington uh, downtown, the Cape Fear River, and where these naval stores barrels are for shipping is over across the river on Eagles Island. And uh, that's another uh, interesting area to talk about as well. Just to show you a couple of those down in the Green Swamp, uh, this is a picture. This is right after a burn. Uh, that's one of the best times to be able to see these. There's multiple ones in the green swamp. You can see the soil dug out around the area, piled up in this area. That would have been the tar kiln. You can see it here with the um, inkberry bushes that were burned. Uh, this is one of the reasons you have prescribed fires is to remove a lot of the shrubs so that the grasses and herbs can grow better. Uh, on the ground. 
In this particular case, a tree was cored in here, I cored it with a tree core is over 100 years old. So obviously this tar kiln uh, was in place back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. You can also see uh, evidence of V notches on uh, the trees in the green swamp. Both of these pictures from shoestring savanna in the green swamp. You can see two trees here that are partially healing themselves. As you can see, this would have been the cut. And what you do is you cut a foot or two, let that you know, resin ooze out, and then you'd come back and cut some more so that the resin would ooze out of the, the newer cuts. So this was a very important industry in the late 1700s and 1800s going into the 1900s. Well, that's over exploitation where agricultural activity also leads to the loss. And this is a picture showing you changes over time. This is 1938, there's Lake Waccamaw. Everybody knows that if you have a straight line in nature, humans made it because there's very few straight lines in nature. It's a couple in geology like joint patterns, but not for the most part. And what you can see here by 1955, new additional ones are added. And by 1990, you can see how much was put in. This was done to build roads as well as ditching to allow silviculture or forestry uh, to put in loblolly pines and others for the forest industry. And by the way, this is just a picture over here with a false color infrared shot. The red is uh, the big trees. And what you can see here very importantly, they don't cut everything all at once. Uh, you clear an area like shown here, but there's other areas in various stages of growth. So it may be a monoculture kind of uh, silviculture or agriculture, but it does provide you know, some uh, habitat uh, for the critters as well. And those various stages of growth provide different kinds of habitat too. So let me make sure to tell you that, you know, I think the forest industry is really valuable. Uh, most of it's in private hands in North Carolina. And if you look at it, you know, forestry is really very important. It's over a $20 billion industry uh, in North Carolina. So anyway, it's really, really important. But managing those forests and managing them sustainably uh, is important as well. Well, what's the third one? It's urbanization, urbanization and development. And I think all of us in southeastern North Carolina know all about that. Uh, fastest growing county in the state is Brunswick County. Uh, that was true in 2020, but it's also true of the decade from 2010 to 2019 based on census data. If you look in 2020, Pender County was number 10, New Hanover 12, and Onslow. All through four of those counties are right along the coastline. And these are the four counties that probably have more uh, Venus flytraps, for instance, than any other place in the entire uh, North Carolina area. In fact, Brunswick County, fastest growing one, has some of the best pine savannas. It also has the largest number of Venus flytraps. I call it the nexus of Venus flytraps. So one of the things that we have to be thinking about is what about the development? You know, what leads to uh, the demise of biodiversity is some of this fragmentation and loss of habitat. And this picture is a really good one to show that. This is a land cover map of North Carolina. So this shows you kind of the entire state. I just wanted to hone in over here on our little neck of the woods in southeastern North Carolina. Red means urban uh, development. So you can see New Hanover County. New Hanover County used to be part of that dimple of biodiversity in southeastern North Carolina, but it's no longer. New Hanover County is the second most densely populated county uh, in North Carolina. I think you probably know the number one. But you know, this is you know building out, and there's very few places left that are truly large natural areas in New Hanover County. We want to make sure and preserve some of those in Brunswick. Not saying don't develop, you just need to smart develop. And what we're going to be looking at primarily is this area right in here, which is the Green Swamp. There's Boland Spring Lakes. And by the way, this is Holly Shelter up in Pender County. 
So all of these are really big and important areas for us. And you can see they're really important to us for many, many reasons. And of course, I can't go along without mentioning climate change. Uh, some people are suggesting it becomes the top threat to biodiversity. That is certainly not true yet in our longleaf pine forest, but you know, there's certainly big changes that are occurring. And some people would say that by uh, mid-century, certainly by the end of the century, there's uh, big factors that are changing uh, that can impact us. And one of the things that's happening is, of course, um, if warming temperatures are occurring, that means latitudinal shifts of that temperature. And this is shown very well with these maps. This is a 1990 USDA uh, map showing growing zones in North Carolina. We in uh, southeastern North Carolina are currently in zone eight, this kind of orangey color, as you can see here. But if you look back in 1990, you can see that the orange wasn't as far to the north. So all of these are moving a tad to the north. This is just in a 30 year time frame, and a 30 year time frame is what basically climate means. It's an average of weather over about 30 years. The other thing that's changing a little bit too, uh, October back in the 90s was the driest month. Well, that's no longer the case. April is the driest month. And I think you can testify to that this year with a very, very dry April and now May. My garden is sucking air, it needs some water. But, you know, ge as a geologist, I take a long view. As you can see here, uh, you can see that uh, the modern forest, as we see it now with the pines, and mixed pine oak assemblages are down here. But if you look back over the past, you know, 12 to 18,000 years ago when the glaciers were much further south, our area really had quite a bit of uh, mixed and even boreal forest uh, in the area. But as we got to nine, and certainly by 6,000 years ago, we were reestablishing uh, some of those longleaf pine uh, forest in this area. But let me just say, the big thing today that jeopardizes longleaf forest is not those other three things, it's really the lack of fire because these are fire dependent ecosystems. We call them pyroclimax communities. And so really this fire is absolutely critical. This is a fire suppressed one. This is one with good fire maintenance like the Nature Conservancy and the Forest Service try to do. So that is really what we want to have good controlled fires, prescribed burns, other controlled burns, something that is not going to lead to a crown fire. It's going to lead to a low intensity fire that removes those shrubs that allow for our grasses, our herbs and our beautiful flowers uh, to be there. This is a picture not of our longleaf pine, but it's a TNC picture that I really like just to show you. This is really looking at uh, an area like you might have out west with a ponderosa pine forest, but it's the same idea. An unmanaged forest has a lot of litter, a lot of vegetation, and when you have a fire, then you have the potential for having a crown fire. And then you can have the loss. If you really maintain this over the years using controlled burns, then what you can do is you can have a managed fire that leads to the management of the understory and not the loss of the canopy trees. And as I'm going to show you, if you do this, you're going to have good return of that vegetative material on the ground surface. And longleaf pines are really important. Approximately 900 plant species are only found in longleaf pine forest. And there's 20 or so, some people put it up 29 or so, uh, threatened and endangered species in these. If you went to the south in Georgia and Florida, you'd find the, the gopher uh, tortoise, indigo snake. We certainly do have the red cockaded woodpecker around here as well as to the south. And I just wanted to mention, you know, I, this is an biology class today. I don't mean to do that. But one of the things that's very important to us is to see, you know, which of these species really tell us something about, you know, the health of that ecosystem. And if you look at our area, for instance, along the marshes and across the street of Virginica, the eastern oyster uh, is a really good indicator species. 
keystone species, you all know about the wolf story in Yellowstone and keeping the ecosystem in balance. It's also true of the gopher tortoise uh, down in Georgia and South Carolina and uh, Florida for our longleaf pines. And of course, there's umbrella and flagship species. I like to think of the longleaf pine system as a, an umbrella group or ecosystem because its health is important to ensure the long term sustainability, as it says here, of many different species, including ones that if you ever go down, you'd see uh, down at the green swamp. So anyway, this is really important to us to maintain these systems. So how do we do that? Well, Zach West at uh, the Southeastern office. Uh, this is Angie Carl, who used to be uh, here as fire boss. You know, these people go in and they manage the forest in a great way to be able to, you know, maintain that really healthy uh, understory, that herbaceous grassy cover, as you see it there. And as the little sign says, from fire comes light. And that really is really important. We don't want to have too many trees, you know, blocking canopy, I mean, blocking the understory, and we need to provide a place for longleaf pine seeds to land on the bare ground to be able to germinate. And in order to have this 36th biodiversity hotspot that includes longleaf, we need to do the right thing. And that right thing is by doing fire management. I know all of you know the big word of the past few years has been resilience. You can't say anything without saying resilience these uh, days, but it's really important. And this ecological resilience refers to the ability of the ecosystem to maintain its functions and processes. Well, how does it do that? Well, it does that when you have higher biodiversity. And ecosystems also need resistance to weather disturbances and changes that might be like climate or others. Diversity helps weather that storm. And then, of course, to restore some of these areas, which is what Nature Conservancy and others are doing, try to you know, put back in some of these longleaf pine forests that have such high biodiversity. So restoring longleaf pine forest and the keystone species associated with them is really, really important. So that's what I'd like to spend our time with looking at now. So. About halfway through, got to ask your question. So everybody, which one of these, if any, is not native to our area? So kind of rhetorical question. I think you know what that is. Longleaf, loblolly, and pine pine are all native to our area, but slash pine's not. It was brought to our area from down south, Georgia, Florida area, because it thought to have you know, good uh, forest products. And it did grow well. The only thing is it kind of grows up and then kind of stops growing. Uh, we have many slash pines uh, in the uh, green swamp, but we're trying to thin those and eventually have longleaf uh, in those areas. So let's go to the green swamp. This little yellow box here is where the green swamp is. You see it's in the coastal plain uh, area. This is the yellow box with the green swamp. This is a picture showing you some of the different systems uh, in southeastern North Carolina. This is kind of the arch area, as we call it, the Cape Fear Arch. That's another geologic story I can tell you sometime. But this whole area has a lot of different things like pocosins, uh, salt marshes, riverine habitats. But we want to do the longleaf pine forest and savannas uh, today. So you see all these blocks, all those are areas with forestry. That's all silviculture. Notice the green swamp. So this is an area that's about 16,000 plus acres. About 13,000 of that is in wetland Pocosin areas, and the other three or so thousand is in drier, more, slightly more upland areas that are the wet savannas. You might notice that this area along the coast is growing rapidly. You can see New Hanover County and Leland. So this area is really important to us to hopefully maintain, to maintain that biodiversity. And another little geologic diversion here, I want to show you something that's really important along that area, that line I'm drawing right now. 
So this is Highway 17 as you head towards South Carolina. This is Highway 211. That's where the Green Swamp is. And the area that's on all these pictures is this little square. So I just wanted to show you a picture. You know, keep your eye on the white arrow. That white arrow is pointing to a scarp, as we call it in geology. That scarp separates the Sacristy, which is QS, from the Penn Holloway Terrace. That is where the beach was 700,000 years ago. And in fact, if I were to uh, go lay my towel on the beach, I would have been laying my towel on the beach right there in your supply, North Carolina, because that's what the beach was at that time. So the Green Swamp is up on the Penn Holloway Terrace and the Green Swamp area right in here. This is one of the highest places in Brunswick County at about 62 feet. And you can see this on that LIDAR map. See that same line? That's the sharp boundary, if you will, where you're going up the beach escarpment and then up onto the next area. So that area I just showed you is right there. So what I'd like to do now is show you a couple of things in the Green Swamp. These areas, Bellamy, North Myers, Myers, Eastern Plantation, McKeithen Track, at the Bar Pit, all these are TNC, Nature Conservancy, Longleaf Pine Restoration Sites that my wife and I have been working with them uh, for the last years of looking at what you do to manage those areas. So I want to show you a couple of our series of pictures just illustrate this. This is a picture in 2000. All these pictures are going to be the same site. And all these pictures with these arrows are going to point, be pointing to the exact same trees. So in 2000, this area was cleared and then longleaf pine were planted. So three years later, we got some longleaf. In six years. In nine years. 12 and then 18 years. Notice the growth. Now, this is the really important thing to us of the TNC perspective. TNC has a long view. And in looking at this and managing these areas over time, it really becomes important to see, you know, what are the best management strategies? And what you can see here is in all of these pictures, you know, what would this area have looked like if you hadn't managed this? All these shrubs that are here would be growing up even higher, shading out some of the grasses. And so by doing controlled burns on a kind of regular basis, you're able to manage these areas. And in fact, to show that, what you see here is a change over time. Look at the wiregrass. And what we usually think about in the longleaf pine is a wiregrass longleaf pine assemblage, if you will, or ecosystem. Notice the wiregrass stayed approximately the same over that long period of time, as is the grasses. What changed? The bare ground. So the other thing that changed is, you know, some of that understory that was covering up the area. So by showing that we have the same kinds of grass content, what we're illustrating is that this has been a really good and successful management strategy, along with getting a larger number of trees of larger and larger size. This is the goal for the area. So it's mostly about the fire. Prescribed fire versus fire suppressed areas. So let me show you a picture. This is Big Island in the Green Swamp. People come from all over the world to see this area. Uh, I've had people from met people out there from Germany uh, come over to see the lonely pine savannas and the carnivorous plants. This is before a burn. This is a pre-burn photo taken this year, January 14th. This area was burned on the 9th of February. I'm going to show you a few pictures that go after that. So this picture is on January 14th. This is the burn on the 21st. So this is 10 days after the burn. This is in a month later. You can see all the grasses starting to come back. And then this was taken, the next picture was taken on April 21st. You can see how the grasses have come back. And if I could show you down there and crawl on the ground, I'd show you a whole bunch of Venus flytraps that are coming back as well. 
So if you don't believe me with that one, let me show you another. So this burn was done in December, uh, December 9th. I'm going to show you a series of photos to show you how this restores. Now this was in the dead of winter, so it's going to take longer to recover. By the way, this picture was on the 15th, uh, six days after the burn. That one's on January 14th, February 21st, March 23rd, April 21st. And what you see here, you see these yellow flowers? Those are pitcher plants. That's Saracenia flavor, the yellow pitcher plant that's starting to send its flowers up in that area. And this particular one uh, was a while back, but I love this photo to illustrate because this picture was taken and then look at this one two months later. Look at the grasses. The grasses don't flower unless you have fire. There is some cases where you can get, you know, with some mechanical uh, work, but fire is the absolute best. You see bone set, you see yellow eyes, you see all kinds of uh, flowers uh, in this area. So these savannas that you can easily see on Google Earth images, this is shoestring savanna. This little yellow box is showing this. So you go from the savanna area into this Pocosin. If you want to go in there, you better have your, your bush knife or something to slice your way through because that's really dense vegetation. And as you go from the savanna into that Pocosin, you'll see a change in the soil types. You can see this uh, sandier, less organic, less wet area out here in the savanna called a forest and soil versus that is moving toward the Tohunta soil uh, into the Bacosan area. So the soils, the topography is really important. You can change the world in two to three feet uh, in our neck of the woods. So this area from a slightly different perspective, we call this the wet pine savanna. The ecotone is the magic zone, as we call it. That's the area where we have lots of fly traps, but also many wildflowers and other carnivorous plants, and then the Pocosin. So the vegetation out here would be longleaf pine, wiregrass, Dionysia muscipula, Venus fly traps, and then things like tai tai and pond pines and others uh, in this area. So what's another added benefit of fire? Well, here's some of my favorite flowers. I just had these at the top to start with, and then I said, well, that's not right, because I love all these down here too. So all of these are wildflowers, and the beautiful thing about this, you can go at different times of the year from April to November, and you'd be able to see a different suite of flowers you know, every month. So these are just some of the ones. By the way, my favorite is the pine lily. If you want to see that one, go down in September. But anyway, all of these are really, really important flower species, wildflower species, just illustrating some of the biodiversity that we have there. And of course, the fire, as you can see with this before and after, is to remove some of those shrubs. And so we go from the wire grass, I mean the grass stage to the candle stage, and then eventually to the mature stage. And longleaf can have very long life. Uh, the oldest ones are over 400 years old. And of course, longleafs are really important for habitat as well, for things like our red cockaded woodpecker, our endangered species. And down in the green swamp, these savannas, a uh, study was done, a uh, Duke student looked at uh, the trees that are down there and red cockaded woodpeckers like to have high DVH trees. Uh, Diameter is over 14 inches, 16 inches is really good. And so they'll build their cavity right on into this, into that heartwood. And we got enough trees down there to support uh, red cockaded woodpeckers. We just don't have any. Uh, Orland Spring Lakes does. Last ones we saw in this area is about in 2008, but it's ripe for reintroduction possible. Well, let's shift gears a little bit because I'm probably running out of time. Uh, let me just say that one of the things that we look at here, and you know, sometimes it's good to have those iconic species that you know really get people excited 
And maybe it's a, a way to get them to think about the entire system by understanding and wanting to uh, protect one species. And for us, that one species might be the Venus flytrap. Uh, some people call it the meadow clam. I've never cared much for that term myself, but you know, a lot of people do. So anyway, the Venus flytrap is pretty important. It only occurs uh, in southeastern North Carolina and northeastern South Carolina. You might notice that map there showing again in New Jersey and Florida, but those are introduced uh, species, we believe. And so the Venus flytrap that we have, it's really in our neck of the woods. And as I said, Brunswick County, and I think the Green Swamp is the nexus of flytraps. Now, this is called a facultative wet plant, meaning it occurs in uh, wet areas, uh, 66 plus percent of the time. One of the things about it is called a species of concern. It's not threatened or endangered, but I'll show you a few more things on that in just a second. Well, a lot of people look at the Venus flytrap just like anything, it has some medicinal uses, it says it can enhance the immune system, reduce fatigue, uh, it's a good antioxidant. And if you've got uh, your cat and dog, it might be good for calming skin irritation and mange. One of the things about the Venus flytrap it was Dar one of Darwin's most magnificent of plants. He loved Drosera uh, group more than any other uh, that he knew of. And so thought I'd show you a couple of things with the Venus flytrap. It is used and marketed anyway as an extract, an herbal extract. Uh, you might notice up here in this particular one, it's gluten free. <laughs> uh, it's Venus flytrap juice is 23%. Alcohol is 28% and the rest is distilled water. This little bottle costs about five or six dollars. So if you look at this, you know, the Venus flytrap has been said to be a cure-all, uh, was looked at to be a uh, cancer cure, just like many things, you know, that's thrown out there. Um, I don't think I would believe it. Anyway, if you ever want entertainment factor, uh, I like to read average customer reviews to get my entertainment factor. I know I'm strange, but anyway, if I look at this, uh, here's a product. Here's some of the comments. This guy says it helps his immune system, does a great job for him. His psoriasis is cleared up. Only problem is he says it tastes like flies. Well, there's only one problem with that. And he said it tastes like flies. Let me just tell you what the Venus flytrap eats. The number one thing is spiders. So it should taste like spiders instead of flies. So second is ants, beetles, crickets. Actually, the fifth most thing that uh, the Venus flytrap seems to eat is flies. So maybe it should have been the spider uh, plant or something. Also, by the way, one of these, my dog takes this just fine and uh, works great mixing it with his food. Well, that brings me to something with the Venus flytrap that some guys published uh, in 2018 in American National. It's a really good article. And what they showed was that the things that pollinate the Venus flytrap and the thing that the Venus flytrap eats are very different. And that's pretty smart, right? <laughs> you wouldn't want to uh, eat your pollinator. So by sending up this shoot, you know, six to 10 inches above the plant, then the pollinator is up here and the prey is down in this area. And what the group found was that the sweat bee, the checkered beetle and the longhorn beetle as shown in these pictures were the most common pollinators for the plant. And what they saw down in the bottom was that spiders and ants uh, some beetles, some spiders and ants were really uh, big prey species. So where is the Venus flytrap population? Well, if you look at it within 90 miles or so of Wellington. Here's the green swamp, Holly Shelter, um, Camp Lejeune, and then up in Carteret County, Croatan National Forest. These four sites are some of the large forests that have Venus flytraps. I'm gonna tell you right now, 
it is really critical to maintain these large areas because the smaller areas are subject more to fragmentation uh, for development and also for poaching as opposed to these big ones. So we really need to maintain all the areas as much as we can, but really maintain these areas and maintain them in a really good uh, standing. And that means management. And so Brunswick County, Green Swamp is the nexus, but we also have Boiling Spring Lakes and Military Ocean Terminal at Sunny Point are all good areas for fly traps. And what you can see with this though, is this is the area where the fly trap populations uh, are. So let me hone in to just the Green Swamp. This is Highway 211, you're going up uh, north from Supply. This is Big Island, this is a blow up of this area. All of these little IDs of yellow are plots that Dell and I, my wife and I have been doing with the uh, Nature Conservancy since 2013. It also shows you the other plant I mentioned, Lysimachia uh, plots as well. So these are what some of the plots look like. Uh, this is a one by three meter uh, plot area. And this is just showing you what we do. So we count the plants in there and we determine you know how important fire is we count uh, flowering percents numbers of plants and all those things and i'm not going to bore you with all of the, the stats today uh, i can do that any other time but today i just want to concentrate on you know really it means a lot to have proper management because what we see is that whenever you have a post burn such as this one 10 months post burn the flowering percentages go up dramatically and so to make sure we get good seeding, then you know, fire is really critical. In a time whenever you've had really thick grass, like shown here, the flowering percent is much less, down around 3%. So it's really important to make sure that you have fire to encourage these. And one other thing that happens, the size of the plant even changes. And looking at this particular one, this was a burn uh, that was done. And this is Little Island. And you can see this is the same knife. You can see the size of those plants. So it's about the size of my knife here. But if you look at this one, this is after several years of grass continuing to grow. Look at the size of the plants. There's still quite a few in there, but look at the size. They're being reduced and they also don't flower near as much. So this one is time for another fire to come through. But on a two to five year basis, three might be the average time or two to three. That is what we need for managing these kinds of areas. And this is just the kind of data that we have on there uh, that just to show you that we do uh, get data that shows the monitoring, the fire, the numbers of species, et cetera. So just as a summary though, let me just put it this way. The grass density is really important. Uh, reduction size begins in about the second to third year if you continue to let the grass grow. There's minimal flowering uh, after a dormant season burn. The dormant season burn is one that occurs in the winter, somewhere from January to early March. And so whenever they flower is in late May to early June. So you're not going to have much flowering you know, that close, but it does lead to large numbers of plants. If you look, the year following the burn is when you get maximum flowering. And in fact, this is an example of a maximum flowering following a burn, as you can see here. There's over 120 flowers just in that little area. That's just my hat for scale. So the other thing we noticed is that poaching, uh, you know, they take some of the better plants, so you lead to a reduction in plant sizes. And therefore, if there are smaller plant sizes, there's less flowering associated with that too. So overall plot health is compromised whenever there's poaching. And of course, poaching uh, is important. It's really important for smaller element occurrences. Uh, it was said in this particular article, uh, Venus flytraps at jeopardy of being lost at the hands of poachers. That's not really uh, true in the large populations, but they certainly can decimate some of those areas. We've seen them in the green swamp where they've gone through and removed hundreds and hundreds of plants. 
And it's even more important, though, where you have a small element occurrence of plants where you might only have, you know, 50 to 500 plants uh, that could truly decimate that entire population. So things weren't working. There was a lot of poaching going on. So in 2014, it was changed from a misdemeanor to a felony. And this was the law, 2014 North Carolina General Statute. And what it says here is any person, firm or corporation that digs up or takes it away, that includes the plant or the seeds, is subject to being guilty of a class H felony. In other words, they could get up to 25 months in jail. And just to show you what happens with these, this is a plot that we had. We counted in this one by three meter plot, 157 plants. We came back the next year, the whole area had been poached. There were only 27 plants left in that plot. And just to show you what they do is they go in and just kind of take a little spoon or a spatula and just kind of pop them up. Uh, that is 100 plants right there. So these are relatively small. They don't have much of a root system, so they just kind of pop them out. All these little white arrows are where the divots of plants were. So those are areas that were taken uh, over that period of time. So some people wanted to go in and start considering these to be listed as an endangered species. So a petition was put forth in 2016 to list the Venus flytrap as an endangered uh, species under the 1973 Endangered Species Act. So what leads you to list a plant or animal as endangered? Well, this, you've know, got habitat loss or the habitat quality is greatly jeopardized. Overexploitation, uh, in this case, it could be loss due to poaching. If the existing regulations are failing to protect it or its habitat, and of course, there's other things that can lead to changes as well, climate change, loss of connectivity, et cetera. So the real questions here are, you know, what is the aerial distribution? What are the numbers? And what are the stressors that may be leading to the loss of these? By definition, endangered species are those that are at the brink of extinction now. A threatened species are likely to be at the brink in the near future. Remember, Venus flytrap is a species of concern, so basically you're kind of looking at it to see, you know, if it, is it going in the wrong direction or not. Well, it has been going in the wrong direction because of loss of habitat, etc. So a project was taken uh, underway to actually try to determine, uh, or it's been an estimate of course, but to estimate the numbers of Venus flytraps in the wild. Natural Heritage Program, uh, along with TNC, did some counts back in 2019, but a few more in 2020. What we saw was that they counted over 500,000 plants uh, on public and private areas, and on TNC, over 250,000. Actually, there's many more than that. Uh, now, I'm just telling you this, there's many more than that just in the green swamp. But, you know, the fact of the matter is there are large numbers of plants, but where are most of them occurring? They're mostly occurring on these large uh, element occurrences like the green swamp, holly shelter, Camp Lejeune, and others. So I think a good thing might be uh, if you look at this to consider all the information and move this into something like a threatened species might be a good thing to do be, to make sure that the habitat of these areas are treated uh, a little bit better and looked at a little bit harder. But that's to be determined as we move forward. Just to show you an area, uh, a little bit of data, in 2019 in our plots and transects, we did or counted over 6,000 uh, plants. This is that same picture with 122 flowers in it. And this picture was taken from Little Island here. This little yellow square is an acre of land. And this is just to give you an idea of the numbers of plants. So if you look at the numbers of plants in this particular one, you know, not all plants flower. Uh, a few plants might even have two flowers. So by doing the flower count, you can get kind of an estimate of what those plants are in the area. 
So this is kind of what we looked at in this area to find that there's relatively large number in this very, very rich area. Not all areas are this rich in Venus flytraps though. But anyway, it's just an idea to show you that we do have a richness in the green swamp that we really, really do need to take care of. And fire management is the way to do it. So I know I've run on kind of long probably, but I wanted to try to illustrate to you some of the important parts about our areas, as well as some of the reasons that we might want to try and protect these areas. It's really critical that we have these large, well-managed preserves, like I mentioned, but it's really important too to maintain some of those smaller element occurrences as well to help maintain that biodiversity. Fire is critical. And I think we need a mix of both growing season and dormant season burns. And we work closely uh, and very well with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, they do a fantastic job and they work in conjunction in times with uh, the Forest Service. So it's a real partnership on all of this. We need to think about preventing fragmentation and edge effects uh, for many of these areas. Because one of the things that's been found over time is, and this is really true, I believe it anyway, that the sound of wind in the trees can physically change our mind and bodily systems, really helps us to relax. And if you get out in nature, you know, even with all the problems that we've been having, I think it kind of soothes soul and makes you feel a little bit better anyway. So my final homage to that longleaf umbrella ecosystem is really the North Carolina State Toast that was put out in 1957. Here's to the land of the longleaf pine, the summer land where the sun does shine. Where the wheat grows strong, the strong grow great. Here's to down home, the old North State. So get out there and see a fantastic longleaf pine savanna. You can come to UNCW's campus to see our Zurich Sandhill. You can go to the green swamp to see the wet pine savannas. But just get out there and enjoy if you can. So thanks for bearing with me if you stuck with me this long, and I'd be happy to try and address any questions that you have. Roger, Roger. that was that great. Was great. Um, um, Hearing a little bit of an echo here. The uh, we have a very good turnout. We have a couple questions in the chat box here. Uh, many many thanks for a splendid presentation. Uh, Chuck is asking that he says he hears from the chairman of the North Carolina Plant Conservation Program Advisory Council that the state of North Carolina will soon elevate the status of the Venus flytrap to a threatened species. Um, and he has put in the website for the Venus flytrap champions project. Okay, very good. Yes. Yeah, that's a, uh, we, we actually think the threatened species is the appropriate one for uh, that after looking at it. And even though you do have them in the large preserve uh, areas, I think to make sure that those large preserves as well as some of the smaller ones are protected. Habitat protection is one thing that uh, comes with part and parcel of being listed as a threatened species. So that's a good thing. Okay. We have we have one comment from your uh, reading, reading the comments of products that uh, the person is wondering how how the commenter knew what what flies tasted like. I'm having some problems scrolling through my chat now, so so forgive me, I'm having some technical. Obviously the guy who said it tastes like flies, he's out there eating flies, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so his diet, diet must be uh, messed up anyway. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm, I'm not really able to see much in my chat right now. What, what, can individual citizens or small groups do to help advocate for uh, less less land fragmentation? Um, what can, what's possible here? Any any advocacy advice? I, th I think one of the ones that um, comes to mind immediately is a place like Brunswick County, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, Brunswick County is fastest growing, as I said. They have a 
plan that you can make comments on right now uh, for growth in Brunswick County. And if you go to the Brunswick County website, you can actually go in and uh, write down some of your thoughts as to what are important things in Brunswick County. Uh, I know I did it, and one of the things I put in was to make sure that with the growth that you have is that at the same time you maintain as many of our natural areas as possible. My comment, as I've told many people, is you know why do people come to uh, southeastern North Carolina? One of the reasons coming to southeastern North Carolina is our natural areas, our climate, our river, our coast. Well, you can end up loving something to death. And so what I, what I call it is, you know, you're going to kill the golden goose. So what you want to do is you want to stroke the golden goose to make sure that he stays healthy so that, you know, our natural systems that are so important for, uh, you know, your health, you know, peace of mind, uh, as well as to make sure that people enjoy the things that, uh, uh, they like and came here for that they can do that. So go to the government websites, write your commissioners or council members and just tell them what the importance of green space is and understand that, you know, it really makes a big difference to you. That's really why, you know, there's an economy in some of these places. Ecotourism, you know, nature is a big draw uh, for folks. Very good. It looks like and and it's one of the things you can you can hug a tree and say, I love that tree. But if you can tell them that tree is worth a thousand dollars, economics do speak. And right. so uh, it's important to make sure that they understand that. Very good. It looks like Barbara Smith has her hand raised. Barbara, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, I, is there anything being done? Can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Is there anything being done to create corridors between these uh, preserves so that wildlife can move and increase their um, area to you know, be diverse? Barbara, that is a really excellent question. I wish I had time and could pull up some images. Uh, this is one of the real goals of the Nature Conservancy, but others too. Uh, one of the things that you really do want to have are corridors. And some of the big corridors that we look at is, for instance, going all the way from, say, Holly Shelter down to the river, then up the Black River, up the Cape Fear River system uh, itself by connecting those corridors. And this is why uh, TNC, the Nature Conservancy, uh, as well as the Coastal Land Trust and others by getting easements, by getting purchasing of properties is so important. So if anybody really has uh, the opportunity to talk to their people uh, in whatever county you're in to make sure that you know, some of these areas are protected. The Black River is one that's a focal point uh, right now, simply because of all the old growth cypress trees. But it's not just there, it's also you know, going up the Cape Fear River, the Bladen Lakes areas that would get us all the way further on up the river system. So you hit it right on the head. The absolute best thing is not to have just these isolated bodies, but to have them connected in some way. And purchase is the only way to guarantee that. However, there are other ways to do it with easements too. So anyway, thank you for that question. Um, Brenda Dixon asks if you suggest a particular source for wildflower identification in areas with carnivorous plants. Uh, there's a lot of them out there. If you're thinking about the green swamp in particular, uh, Fowler put a book out just on the green swamp. So that would be an excellent, but you know, those species that he shows for the green swamp uh, are also ones that occur throughout our southeastern North Carolina area as well. It's a great picture book, but it's also a good book with information too. Okay. Great. Jerry is asking if there are any re 
efforts to reclaim some areas that were converted to pine plantations in the green swamp, including restoring the hydrology? Um, the areas that uh, it's not so much in the areas adjacent to the green swamp uh, that's still in silviculture, mm -hmm. but there are areas, you know, right within the green swamp itself that had been planted in, for instance, like slash. And those areas are being uh, planted uh, below the slash. The slash are thinned and then planted with longleaf. And one of the examples I showed you at North Myers Clemens is exactly that. It was a full slash community that was then thinned and underplanted with longleaf pine. So in those particular areas, there are some locations that are doing that. You might see longleaf pine, you know, in some more areas uh, as you drive around than what you used to. So if people have put those in, certainly get better pine straw from them, but you got to be careful with raking too, because that takes out some of the uh, herbaceous and grassy layers. Right. This, Roger, this was fantastic. I wish, I wish we had all day to continue this conversation, but hopefully we'll be able to recruit you for another event, either in in person and or online. Um, but well, I, thank you, I thank you so much. I, I appreciate the opportunity and I uh, hope folks just uh, love it about half as much as I do. I'll be a happy camper because uh, <laughs> it's, it's really it's really something to see. It's a great place and uh, as is much of southeastern North Carolina. Yeah. And uh, I won't I won't show those other 500 slides I've got. I <laughs> well, thank you again. This was fantastic. We're getting all sorts of thank yous in the chat here if you're able to see them. Um, and we'll be sending out the recorded presentation to registrants and we'll also be posting it online at the North Carolina Wildlife Federation YouTube page. And many of us, Jerry wants to see the other 500 slides as, <laughs> as do I. So hopefully we'll be able to do that soon. Next week on Tuesday, the 25th, we'll have Bonnie Monteleone with the Plastic Ocean Project to talk about her research her, and uh, her work with that initiative. And also she'll talk about the ongoing trash crisis in North Carolina right now, which seems to be reaching rather critical proportions. So thanks again, and um, we'll see you next week. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.